go past your cringing that I'm preaching without a jacket on. <laughs> I'm also not going to preach this stage. All right. My title might seem kind of juvenile, which is fitting because that's where I preach it to first in my junior class. It's being a real Christian. In my class, I had noticed um, a few of the kids, they really seem, you know, they're going down to the altar with sincerity in their heart. It seemed like they were making a change in their life only to come back the next week. And as a teacher, you're faced with the same problems of misbehavior, the same um, just disrespectful nature, you know, of some of them and stuff. And it, and it begs the question, you know, was the, repent was the repentance sincere, you know? So as children, whenever they, whenever you're teaching kids, it's it's easy to pack the altars. I mean, I can go up there, you, you read the scripture, and they're, they're boom, you know? All the little kids are running up there and stuff, you know? And yeah, some of them, they might be going just because they see their friends and stuff, but um, we need to make sure that we don't lose sight, you know, of what we're doing. It has a purpose, it has a reason. There's a worth of being a real Christian. Amen. For my first point, I only have two, so we'll get out pretty early tonight. <laughs> being a Christian, oh, come on, don't even that. <laughs> being a Christian means to be different than who you were as a sinner. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can prove it is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, these, these points, if they, they are so simple, so basic, but in Christianity, a lot of times we get away from the basics. And I remember when I went, I went to pastor, I said, hey, I'm struggling with some stuff in my life. And he asked me the question, and it was like a slap in the face. He said, what did I preach on last week? And, I mean, sometimes pastors make the boogeyman blush, he's so intimidating. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm sitting there in his office, and I'm like, classic kid answer, the Bible? Yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> the Lord? <laughs> but I couldn't tell him. I, I couldn't tell him, you know. What he was doing there was showing me, you know, that, you know, where I was spiritually, it was nobody's fault but my own. You know, that I was sitting in sitting and going through all the services and stuff, and yet I wasn't getting much out of it, right? Because I, I couldn't even tell him what he preached on last week, you know? He, he would ask me, you know, well, how's your Bible reading doing? And I would say, oh, wow, well, you know, then he's looking at me like, what in the world, man? You, you need to, you know, go back to the basics. You're getting away from, you know, the basics of reading your Bible every day, paying attention in church, you know? As Christians, we, we go through the motions, and, and we have to be careful to not let them just be that. Just let it be a simple routine that we all go through, because when that happens, we, we can grow so cold as Christians that we lose, we lose that first love. I want to talk to you about a few different people in the Bible today. In the first one, I'm going to go over to Acts chapter 9. talk about a man who went through such a powerful transformation. we got Saul, Saul charges right here. Acts 9 verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found at any of this way, whether they, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Imagine the hate that filled that man's heart. Hatred towards the people of God. If any of you have ever grown up in church and maybe back so got away from things of God, Satan loves to do use that exact tactic to throw hatred towards the people of God there. He wants to manipulate you, manipulate your feelings towards Christians. You know, because of course, you, I mean, you're, you're never going to be comfortable, you know, back so in the service as long as you, you know, Pastors preaching the truth. There's a lot of church nowadays where you know that, that isn't the case. Sometimes I go on vacation, wish that going at, at these different churches and stuff. I was at one time with a guy, he was up there living music in a Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and flip flops. You know, one of the times the guy gets says a, a dirty, filthy joke from the pulpit. You know, and that was the guy giving the sermon. 
lot of times we don't realize what we have spiritually coming from churches that preach the truth. Amen. Amen. Saul, he really just had the truth slap, slap him right in the face when he was on that, on that road as he was going to Damascus. Whenever we're confronted with the truth, you are always given a decision. You can accept it, you can, re you can reject it. Right. Both those have consequences. If, you, if we jump over to uh, Acts 22, verse 4, which is a quick verse, I want to show you the severity of Paul's persecution. This is from his own words. 22, verse 4. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women. This guy was persecuting, persecuting unto the death of the church that day. Imagine a few months after this, brother or sister so and so, they go into the church, and who do they see in the, you know, in the pulpit? It's, they see that man who was hunting them down like animals. You know? But that's a transformation. You see, that, that's not who he was. He was different. You gotta examine yourself as a Christian. You gotta take time in your day to say, okay, well, where am I with the Lord? Who am I compared to who I was before, you know? I had this relationship with God. If you can't say there's ev there's evident differences there, you might, you might need to call into question a lot of things about your spiritual life. If you're still, you know, running with the same crowd, doing the same things you used to do before before your salvation experience. <coughs> I mean, look at, like I said, look at Paul. He ended up writing 13 books of the New Testament. I want to bring 13 people to God. This guy. I mean, come on. 13 books of the New Testament, possibly Hebrews, depending on if you attribute it to him. But we live in this modern day Christianity to where, you know, we forget that God can save people Amen. that dramatically. Amen. We look at the drag addict on the street and we say, oh, no, we're not going to bother with him. He's probably not even in the right mind, you know, which oftentimes that is true. Some of your words are lost on him, you know, but then go back to one, go back to one and sober up, you know, give him the word because God hasn't changed. The church is changing nowadays. People are changing. We're getting farther and farther away from God. Farther from the, the reason why we do everything we do is to serve God. We owe God our lives. He sent His Son to die on the cross for all of our sins, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible tells us. Every, everyone, everyone who's ever and come has the age, of account, the age of accountability and sin has that debt placed upon them. We're no more, no less guilty than, than what Saul Tarsus was. We might think, you know, well, what I do, it's, not, it's nothing like that. I mean, these, these lies that I tell, you know, I'm always, you know, trying to relate to my junior class and stuff, you know. Well, I, I show them, you know, well, lines of sin, you know, all, the, all these different things that you think you know, kids go through. But nowadays and stuff, with everything that kids are exposed to, they're, mature, they're, they're maturing at such a rapid rate. It, it, it's so heartbreaking to see kids that are exposed to stuff, you know. You have unfiltered access to the internet. If you're in public schools, you know, the people that they're around, you have no idea what's going on because you as a parent, you know, again, I don't have any kids, but I grew up in church and I grew up in both public school and private school. You get exposed to certain things, you know. And it's having that, you know, real Christianity in your life to be able to say, hey, you know what, guys, I, I got to go. I don't want to be around that. Amen. Saul got a new name. Tonight, if you realize that there is sin in your life, you can have a new name too. Maybe your name is backbiter, it's liar, thief, whatever it is. You can have that new name tonight. Paul transformed himself and he made himself useful, which is in my second point. Uh, being a Christian means to be usable. We all know that if we want to be used by God, we got to do what we got to submit. Not just part of ourselves, all of ourselves. Because with that submission comes a lot of things that can help us. James 4 17, I'm sorry, James 4, uh, verse 7 tells us, which is a very simple verse, very short. Submit yourselves therefore to God, who is this the devil, and he will flee from you. The Bible doesn't say, it doesn't, you know, say, he might flee from you, he doesn't really want you to get you to sin. He is going to flee from you as long as you submit yourself to God. But with all the distractions,
distractions of this world, that submission sometimes isn't 100%. We love to say, well, God, I'll submit this area of my life to you. I'll submit my Sundays to you. My Friday nights, those are mine, you know. I'll submit, you know, my family to you, but as far as my job, I've got to make that money. I've I got to miss Sundays. I can't, I can't work a Sunday. I've got to make money. I can't submit that part. It comes with total submission. I want to talk to you guys about two different men in the Bible. They both had varying degrees of submission. The first one's going to be Samson. We're going to go back to the book of or, Sorry, go back to the book of Judges, the Old Testament. And we're going to be Judges chapter 14. Whenever you think of Samson, there's a name that's paired along with him, right? Samson and Delilah, right? It's not... Whenever we're reading through that story, we're skimming through it, we think that it's an isolated incident. It wasn't. It's right here. Judges 14, verse 1. And Samson went down to, to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came and told his father and mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, for, now therefore, get her from me to, to wife. It seems like Samson wasn't submitting his eyes to God. Whatever he was putting in front of him, he wasn't submitting that to God. You go on further down and it shows them that they're walking through the vineyards and stuff like that. Wasn't he not supposed to be around that? I mean, wasn't he not supposed to partake in that? Lo and behold, what we see in our day to day life, it can take us to some ways that we never thought we would go. Let's go to Judges 16, verse 1. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her. You're starting to see a pattern here. And in, in your Christian life, you have. You have a recognizable pattern of falling down, of falling back into the same sin over and over and over and over again. You need to call into question, you know, is that repentance sincere? Or am I just going through the motions? Look at, look at Samson. I mean, so we, we should be, you know, just massive amounts of strength, you know, him tearing out the gates of the city running, and running with him, you know, all these powerful things, but he had a weakness and the devil knew it. You can't hide your wings from the devil. The devil knows what exactly to tempt you with. Right. He's not going to take it easy on you. Right. Samson had a problem. And, and the devil exploited that problem. And the devil's going to exploit all, any, any problem that you allow to fester and grow in your life. No one is strong enough to be able to handle sin. Sin is going to corrupt you. It will tear your life apart. Amen. Just a few verses over. Verse 4. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was, and finally now, Delilah. With these other women, he, he never revealed his strength, right? He got away from them. He ended up going back, killing more Philistines, getting that jawbone, killing a bunch of people, right? And even with that, you know, not providing, you know, the drink water and the jawbone, but he kept going back to it, and he got worse. Because what happens with Delilah? We all know the story of Samson with what he does. She begs him, and he lies to her. He says, oh, you know, you're just buying me in cords. You just do all these things. And of course, all they were big for they were lost. None of them were true. But then she got to him. The devil knows how to get to you. He'll send that, he'll send that girl, he'll send that guy. He'll send whatever, whatever it is that he knows can finally get to you. Maybe the devil knew he couldn't totally break Samson down at first, but he started chipping away at him. Right. And we think these little things, they're not going to totally ruin us spiritually. They're not going to ruin our family. They're not going to tear us apart. But the devil's got a plan. Yeah. That's right. No one's that strong. Go to uh, verse 26, Judges 16, 26. And Samson said, uh, and, and Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. 
That guy has no choice but to be humble there. The little boy of the Philistines, of the enemy, leading him around after they plucked out his eyes. We get so prideful, we get so arrogant. Oh, I can handle this. Oh, no, you don't understand my life, Brother Brad. You don't understand my life. You don't, you don't know what I'm going through. I can handle this. This is okay. Come on. Led about by a lad, by a little boy. Let's see the end of them. Now the house was full of men and women, and of all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about three thousand men and women that beheld, that beheld while Samson made sport. The devil wants to make fun of you. He wants you to be that one that everybody looks at and says, look at that guy, oh, oh, that Christian? Let me tell you what he does on the weekends. The people were around so much, you know, our coworkers, for example. It's hard to fool them. Whenever you're frustrated, whenever you're getting mad, you that's why always be careful of our testimony, always be careful of how we're acting, how we're behaving, the things we're saying. You have to guard that. And as soon as that image is skewed in their minds, have fun trying to get them to the church. They're going to think, why would I want to be a fake like you? You claim to be a Christian, you know? But I see how you are on the job site. <clears throat> I mean, let's talk about the family, for example. If you're different at home with how you are raising your kids, then you know that you are the man who sits in the pew at church. They're going to notice that. Inconsistency is burned into the minds of children. They remember inconsistent actions far after they're gone. Be careful of that. Samson, he went to places he, he should not have gone. He did things. Inconsistency. God was able to use him to kill 3,000 Philistines that night. But don't let it be at the end of your life where you decide to serve God. Don't let the devil waste your youth. Don't let the devil waste the time that God has blessed you with. Because every day we wake up with another with breath in our lungs is a gift given from the Lord. Not everybody has that. None of us thought the Lord was going to pass away today. You know, we knew he was in bad health. We knew we were all nervous. But then as soon as we get to camp, we hear the news. None of us is guaranteed tomorrow. Life is but a vapor, right? right. And yet we all play the game. I got time. We don't say it like that. We don't admit to ourselves, but our actions admit it. The choices that we make. I'll just double up on Bible reading tomorrow. It's the little things. It's not, I'm not talking about, you know, just told you, just quit going to church. You know what? I was up late last night. Maybe I'll just skip up reading, sleep in a little bit before I go to work. Visitation, going out with the community. You know, man, I got homework to do. I got kids to raise. Whatever the excuse may be. People see that. Your kids see that. As a teacher, the kids in my class, they see that. Let's talk about Peter. Out of the chapter 16. how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That was blowing my mind. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, thou shalt not, this shall not be unto thee. Who does Peter think he is rebuking the Lord? Rebuking Jesus Christ. Now before we before we get all high and mighty and down on Peter, don't forget that we do that in our own lives as well. Whenever God places a calling on our life, and we say, oh God, you don't understand. I got plans for my life. And we rebuke the Lord for, for that calling. We say, no, you don't know what you're talking about, God. No. Again, we 
don't say those words, but our actions say them. Whenever we run from our callings, whenever, whenever, whenever the Holy Spirit presses upon you, like, hey, that friend of yours, you need to go witness to him. You need to stand up for what those people are doing around you. That stuff is not right. And when you quench the Holy Spirit time after time, there's going to be a fix. Peter rebuked the Lord. So can you today. Whenever that, whenever God deals with your heart, you say, oh, God, no. I have time, God. God created, you know, the idea of time, of what it is. You know, he's beyond it. And yet we trust in our own selves, in our own idea of what, of what time is and what, how much we think that we have. None of us is guaranteed that. Matthew 26, 69. It might have started off with, you know, him, re him rebuking Jesus. But let's see, you know, I hope you guys are recognizing a pattern here of things getting progressively worse and worse with each of these bad decisions. Matthew 26, 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace. This is after, of course, Jesus was taken. Now, now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him and said, That also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all. Wait a minute, wasn't this the guy that just got that sword and knocked that guy's ear off? This is probably like an hour or two after that. A man so brave come, goes up in arms to fight for the Lord. And then a little damsel comes. And she just asks him a question. You were, she makes a statement. You, you were with Jesus, weren't you? She's not running to the guards. She's not saying anything. It's just a simple denial. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were with it, that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereaved thee. Betrayed. Then began he to curse and to swear, and he's going to prove him wrong now. I know not the man, and immediately the cop crew. You can't think the world can't spot a Christian, especially when you're on the job, when you're with your family, if you remember you're spending some time with some unsafe family members. You don't think they're going to spot that you're a little bit different than everybody else? You get just weird questions like, hey, do you go to church when the subject doesn't even come up? Why? Because you're different. Because you're not cussing with every other word. Because you aren't talking about getting with girls. Because you're not talking about the next, the next fad, whatever it is. You are set apart. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can't try to play that we can belong in the world, like Peter here was trying to do. Oh, I don't know who. Gee, I don't know the man. I never met the man. Tonight, if you, if you realize that you are like Peter and you deny Christ, there's still hope. Let's look about 50 days later. Let's look about in Acts chapter 2, verse 37.
The same as Samson. Samson killed about 3,000 Philistines that day. This day, Peter was able to save 3,000 people. Make yourself usable by God. Don't waste your time. You think the devil's going to take care of you? You think the devil has something good for you? The Bible says God knows his thoughts towards us, the thoughts of peace, and to give us an expected end. We already know as Christians, we already have the, the victory. That's like you're, you're 10 to 0, and you're winning, winning some, some football game or whatever, and you say, you know what? I don't, I don't, think, we're good. I don't think we got this. We, anybody read Revelation? I think I know how this ends. I think we all know how this ends. If you, conti if you continue, if you fully submit yourself to God, not with what you pick and choose, not with, you know, not like Samson, well, he had his little pet sin. He, he loved women. He would look upon them. Matthew 5, 28 tells that who's going to look upon a woman to lust after her, come in and build her up with, with, with him and himself. Guys, No one's strong enough to handle sin. No one's strong enough. Do you think your unsaved friends are strong enough to handle your bad testimony that you give? Now, I want to end up on a positive note. There is still hope. Revelation 2, verse 5. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to thee quickly, and move that candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. Those of you who run up in church, sometimes we tend to overthink salvation, and those of you who only want to I overthink everything in my life, I mean, to a ridiculous extent. <laughs> but, remember therefore, this is what it says, this is what you got to do. Remember where you came from, and do what you did when you started this whole thing. Good. That's it. Remember where you came from. Remember where, from where you were falling. Do what you did at the start of this. 